And a heads up to my panelists and my attendees, the session is being recorded. Um, so, and I have already started the recording. So just be cognizant of that. We are here at uh, 9 a.m. And we're gonna get started as I see a number of people are still loading in, uh, but I just have a few things that we'll cover off first. Um, so welcome, this is our sixth installment of Side Dish our series of educational word workshops for food service professionals. Today is all about plant powering your menu. Um, you know, I want to start off by saying that we're, we're not here to convert anybody to vegan or make anybody feel bad for their food choices. Uh, today, we're really here to talk about the opportunity for you as restaurants and restaurateurs to capture market share and new customers. Um, Often, I think it's people with very specific food choices, be it allergies or lifestyle, are the ones who are going to dictate uh, where you're going to choose to dine out. Uh, and as restaurants, if you don't have what it takes to get those people coming into your restaurant, uh, you're definitely limiting your opportunity. I firmly believe that plant-based is here. It's not a fad. It's not a trend. Uh, restaurants that embrace uh, can certainly, you know, elevate uh, their game uh, and even capitalize on this particular mar market share. Uh, it's not just about bums and seats. Uh, there is a potential for a lot of profit to be made in this growing segment. Um, this particular market segment can typically have a lower food cost and one done right. You can sell at a premium. Um, in comparison to your traditional center of the plate offerings. Uh, I saw a really inter interesting statistic yesterday on food, food, pardon me, food price inflation. And according to Statistics Canada, uh, meat is rising at about 8.1%, fish and seafood at 3.8% uh, in comparison to vegetables, which is at one6 and fruit being down about a half a percent. Um, and what I really wanted to do here is just think about this in comparison to menu prices that we are seeing uh, that are either have not moved in some time or are typically staying quite low. I'm gonna share my screen here. And I'll just ask Steve, give me a quick nod, to make sure you can see my screen. Good. Um, let me just pull up my other notes here, just quickly here. Uh, we have a really informative session that we're gonna go over. Uh, certainly is gonna be a very fast paced 90 minutes. Let me frame up uh, what we're gonna be doing today. We have two of the top manufacturers that are pr producing uh, specifically plant-based products uh, for this market segment. Uh, each of these companies have uh, compiled a ton of information statistics uh, on their plant-based product solutions. Up first, we're going to throw it over to Brian Kincaid from Beyond Meats. Uh, and then we have Brad Shear from Greenleaf Foods, uh, which has the Light Life and Field Roast brands under their portfolio. Uh, and they've also invited uh, their culinary director and author of the cookbook Field Roast. Uh, which is 101 artisan vegan meat recipes uh, to cook, share, and savor. Uh, after our supplier partners have had an opportunity to present, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion with everybody that we have here. Our special guests are Manel and Ben Kilford, uh, the owners of Grounds and Greens Cafe in White Rock, BC, which is a brand new restaurant that has opened up uh, with a 100% plant-based menu. Uh, and then we also have our very own district sales manager, Steve Gropp, uh, who has been living a 100% uh, plant-based lifestyle for nearly one year now. Uh, and we're going to talk through uh, opening a plant-based restaurant as well as the challenges uh, faced when choosing to dine out. And then lastly, we're going to open up the floor to any questions and answers that uh, any of our attendees may have. 
Uh, so certainly um, don't hesitate to wait. If you have a question, type it into the chat box and then we can touch back at it uh, at any point. I'll be moderating. Uh, so please, again, feel free to ask questions. Uh, I firmly believe that knowledge is power. Um, whatever takeaways that you're able to take away from today and apply it into your business tomorrow will certainly give you an advantage. So uh, let's get things started here and I'll throw it over to uh, Brian from Beyond Meats to kick us off. All right. Uh, there we go. Everybody hear me? Sweet. Thank you for having me, Michael. No problem. If you can, just try and, and speak up as much as you can. Uh, just on the phone, you're a little bit more faint, uh, but uh, just try and speak up as much as you can. Man, that is the first time nobody's uh, ever, everybody normally tells me the opposite. I, you know, pipe down, but um, is that coming through okay? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, okay. Yeah. If, uh, if you'd like to start running through the slide, uh, right on cue. So, <clears throat> uh, to give you a little bit about my background with uh, the company, um, I started with Beyond back in 2012 when we had about a dozen people in the office. And at that point, um, you know, uh, sentiments like Michael's of, you know, plant-based is here to stay. It's certainly not a fad. I pretty much joined up a startup company that um, I, I bought into just out of sheer pragmatism. It sounded, you know, very efficient that uh, we were taking a fraction of the food um, a chicken was going to eat or a cow was going to eat, a fraction of the water, and in a fraction of the time, we put protein out on a plate. I'm, um, you know, I'm somebody that, that uh, grew up camping and hiking and having a reverence for the outdoors. Uh, and I just, I, I bought into it, you know, from, from that side, but, uh, I had to defend myself to, to all my, you know, college buddies. It's like, dude, why are you working at this crazy vegan company? That sounds ridiculous. Well, uh, fast forward, you know, Michael, I guess this, this, uh, little startup company is here to stay. And, um, when I was initially, uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, when I was initially talking to um, Ethan, uh, the fellow there on the left, uh, back in, in 2012, you know, I, I had a question for him uh, that I, I really wish I could take back. Um, you know, I, I, I buy into the simplicity of this, but, you know, this is a vegan product. You're, you're not going to brainwash me to be one of these crazy paint-throwing vegans, right? And he goes, BK, BK, absolutely not. No, I don't I throw in paint. That's that's not a good look. And uh, the the point being is that while we do manufacture a wholly plant based product, this product is not made to serve vegans. Um, there was a there was a gentleman who shared a picture of his first vegan meal, and it was a, uh, it was a you know potato, and um, you know very adventurous certainly. Uh, we recognize that a uh, majority of our consumer are folks that have had the same diet growing up as, as the, you know, a majority of us, which is, you know, the, the, the classic staples, you know, your burgers, your meat and potatoes, quite literally. So we wanted to meet them on their journey and give them something that uh, is, is reminiscent, is familiar, is, is much more approachable than um, a very, you know, whole plant diet where, you know, you have your grains, your greens, your lentils. Somebody who, who's been having a burger every day is going to take a look at that and say that that looks like rabbit food. Um, and we're not going to be able to address uh, much bigger issues um, such as, you know, resource constraints, climate uh, issues, by feeding them uh, rabbit food. We, you know, if we can address those issues by feeding them a burger that uh, tastes and cooks exactly as the traditional animal burger that they've already had, well, that's going to be a more effective way of meeting them where they are. So uh, by that, you know, sort of uh, train, a, train a logic, that's where Beyond Meat set out to be a different company in the plant-based space, which was traditionally just feeding vegans and vegetarians. We can uh, go to the next slide. 
and this speaks to specifically, you know, um, what what uh, what I had kind of hinted at uh, our tenants, and that would be positively impacting the climate, uh, as well as the global resources that go into uh, the the production of animals, uh, and also just you know improving our you know human health. The uh, the the cool thing about plant based diet, uh, no cholesterol in there. But in addition to that, you're going to see less saturated fats uh, while still getting the same amount of protein. Continuing on. And this speaks uh, just towards that, that efficiency um, of the product, which, uh, which again, got me hook, line, and sinker, uh, vastly more efficient. And as, um, as these issues start to become more paramount, uh, even somebody that, that continues to eat meat, be it sustainably raised or, you know, maybe uh, they, they go out on their hunting trip, this is stuff that will absolutely still resonate with them. So by no means do we, need, do we mean to, to pick fights with anybody that consumes meat. Um, majority of the people that work at our company, I would, I would wager, still consume some type of animal product. We, we got nothing but love for people that, you know, they got empty bellies on the planet. They're just hungry. Uh, so that at the end of the day, we are all sharing this planet, and uh, we want to uh, we want to make sure it stays that way, and doing so in a sustainable way. And um, again, one of the things that separates us uh, from the majority of the other um, manufacturers in the category is that we wanted to make a product that was clean and simple but still had the functionality, the flavor, the satiation that you got with animal meat. So in, in going to the simplicity aspect of it, um, I, I know, you know it, it's complicated for a lot of folks to take a look at something like a Beyond Burger and wonder, how'd you make that from plants? Well, uh, it's pretty daggone simple. Uh, you take um, the protein component comes primarily from peas, like chickpeas. Uh, we also use brown rice and lentil protein in there. We get our color from beets and pomegranate juice. The uh, the fattiness and, and uh, the juice that's dripping out when you throw it on a grill, well, that's coconut oil. We put all of these uh, dry and liquid ingredients along with, um, you know, just salt, pepper, garlic powder into uh, an extruder. And it goes through a process that's very similar to baking. Um, but under, uh, I, I kind of imagine it or would liken it to a, a big old Play-Doh machine uh, that's got some uh, heating and cooling chambers in there. And under immense pressure, we start to churn out um, some strands, which mimic uh, the strands of your ground beef. Continuing on. Yep, this speaks a little bit. Uh, more specifically to uh, to where we get our proteins and our minimal uh, minerals from, but ultimately we are trying to recreate all the benef uh, the nutritional benefits that you do get in animal meat um, and subtract out some of the drawbacks. I had already alluded to cholesterol and, and saturated fat, and we are finding that we can do that within uh, the plant kingdom. All right, and again, just um, uh, another sort of point of differentiation uh, within uh, the plant-based category itself. Um, I personally don't have a stance on GMOs. Uh, I think that there's a lot of empty bellies on the planet, and uh, however we can feed them, great. Uh, but I am very, very proud of the fact that we can put a uh, non-GMO project seal on every single one of our products. Ultimately, our goal is feeding the widest variety of eater, be it a meat eater or a plant-based eater. And, uh, you know, whether it comes to dietary restrictions, um, ideological preferences, you name it. I want every single person on the planet to be able to enjoy Beyond Meat product. And by having a non-genetically modified, a soy-free product, a dairy-free product, a gluten-free product, we are able to do that. So continuing on, Michael.
Yep, this speaks uh, a little bit to the decline of soy. And again, you know, nothing against these ingredients. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's simply up to the operator's discretion. And by providing something that's more inclusionary, uh, that is soy free, we're able to do so. Continuing on. And there probably is just a tiny bit of lag by the time that I advance the slide and then when Brian sees it. So we, we are advancing the slides as you're prompting Brian. Ah, thank you, sir. Um, so the, the growth of the plant-based category as Michael alluded to is absolutely booming right now. And um, especially during the, the current climate, believe it or not, and I think we have some slides that can speak towards it a little bit later. Um, uh, you know, whether it's uh, concerns around meatpacking plants and things of that nature, we are seeing uh, a big growth in this category. You can keep on moving, Michael. Uh, majority of this growth is coming from a, uh, a younger demographic, be it uh, folks who are starting uh, younger families or younger families of uh, younger members of those families kind of dictating uh, their their menus. And um, when you're when you're talking about uh, negating the veto vote, as Michael spoke towards, those are generally the, the folks that will steer uh, steer the menu. And by having um, an alternative protein option on the menu, you're able to uh, at least negate that veto vote. And uh, again, this speaks towards um, the the sort of health aspect um, that that uh, that I was I was talking about. You have the specifics on here, whether it's cholesterol, whether it's weight loss, um, or folks are just you know they're feeling better about their choice not to have meat. It's something that they can smile on. So simply by having this on the menu and enabling somebody to say, "Yep." I'm going to have a burger or a steak later on this weekend. I kind of feel guilty about doubling up. Oh, they can sub a beyond patty. Perfect. That's that's really where where we're trying to hit on and, and where uh, we're seeing a ton of growth. Okay, so preparing for a new normal. Boo. Uh, you guys uh, can uh, can review this on on your own time. Um, and I'm sure a number of you have experienced this uh, out there in the field, so I don't mean to, to beat a dead horse. Um, but yes, uh, we absolutely want to be a part of that process with you all. And this speaks towards uh, the growth over prior year. Um, those numbers are pretty substantial, 200% increase in, um, in plant-based versus animal-based over prior year. Uh, over the last eight weeks uh, since April, 265% increased. And uh, Michael, if you want to keep on moving through these slides here, um, we've got uh, Beyond Meat's growth within that category. So it's, um, it's not so much you know, just kind of the growth of the category in general. It's, um, you know, it's, it's the fact that, uh, that based on Beyond Meat, and this is the next slide, there we go. Uh, it's based on the fact that Beyond Meat's diverse catalog, as well as, um, like I said, just very sort of uh, clean ingredient label, inclusionary ingredient label, we are able to grow that category. And moving on. Uh, the biggest way we're able to do it, I mean, it's because the stuff tastes good. If we're, you know, if we're out there to tell a meat eater, hey, you know, nothing wrong with eating meat, uh, we think you might enjoy this, those folks are going to be incredibly discriminating. You know, this is this has got to stack up. And um, we don't put a product out there unless our guy Ethan and all of his meat-eating friends, Ethan, by the way, doesn't eat meat, but he absolutely keeps meat eaters in a circle because he needs to make sure that this stuff holds a candle. 
And moving on, in addition to the product, we've got a very significant uh, social following, something we absolutely love when operators leverage. Um, we always love when, when folks tag us, uh, you know, whether it's a mom and pop or a big chain, because then that becomes ammunition that we can blast out on our social channels, which, and I apologize, these figures are, are pretty outdated. Um, but, you know, that's, that's how we kind of galvanize our, uh, our, our, uh, our legion out there. And uh, going forward, um, just, uh, just a couple slides on some of the recent initiatives we've been doing. Did a Feed a Million campaign where some of our um, ambassadors as well as uh, shareholders, fellow shareholders, you know, uh, between Kevin Hart, Snoop Dogg, and a number of athletes, uh, we were able to give out over a million Beyond Burgers um, to first-line responders as well as, you know, even just I remember my, my food truck driver down in L.A. showed up at uh, uh, for about like two weeks straight, was rolling into local supermarkets uh, between midnight and 3 a.m. to feed the folks that were stocking shelves. And this is, you know, this climate, uh, again, don't mean to beat a dead horse. But it's going to take everybody uh, kind of banded together, and I take a lot of pride in, in seeing all the positive work that you know that that we've uh, that we've enacted in, um, just to you know just to kind of move it forward. Uh, the next slide again is something that you guys uh, and gals can use at your leisure, uh, just along communication guidelines, and uh, following that we've got all our offerings. Each slide uh, has specifics on there um, towards uh, towards each of them, um, but uh, you know, as you can see, we have the Beyond Burger both in a three ounce and a four ounce size patty. Uh, they are both the same bun coverage. The advantage to the three ounce is that you can cook it from frozen. Uh, the four ounce is the one um, that you see in grocery stores. And you thaw it out, um, and you cook it from fresh. The Beyond Beef is basically the same um, matrix or medium as the the preformed patties. Just comes in one pound bricks. We have our beef crumbles, which come frozen, and you cook from frozen. Those go in in chilies, tacos, you name it. Um, we have our uh, also, another crumble is a is an Italian sausage pizza crumble. Again, frozen, uh, but it doesn't carry that same juiciness and texture that you get with our our newer products uh, like the fresh items. You know, the ground beef. Uh, and then we have two sausages on the bottom there, uh, the Beyond Breakfast sausage patties, uh, which do come frozen and you can cook from frozen. Makes for a great grab and go item. And the sausage links, again, uh, similar or the same thing as what you would get in the retail uh, outlet. And those uh, can be cooked from, uh, from frozen, but preferably uh, thawed out and cooked from fresh. Uh, I've seen people thaw them out and, um, you know, just kind of crumble them up and use those as a pizza topper and cook it from fresh as well. Uh, each one of these next slides, again, that you can review at any time, just has uh, speaks towards those specific uh, proteins, uh, ingredients, labels, but for the most part, uh, it's pretty simple. Most of our products just have that same blend of pea protein um, for, uh, you know, for the protein source, as I mentioned, coconut oil for the juiciness and beet juice and pomegranate for the color. And uh, Michael, I did have um, a, uh, another slide, or excuse me, another PowerPoint that uh, I'm sure you know, we, can, we can share afterwards, uh, which speaks to uh, some, some alternative recipe ideas. So, you know, uh, sure, it's nice to just see Beyond on the menu, you know, sub Beyond patty or have a specialty burger. Um, but I always like to uh, to kind of think beyond the bun there. And there we go. 
I got those slides uh, queued up here. So if you, and you have a couple of minutes. So if you wanted to walk through a couple of those Beautiful. recipe ideas, I'd we are it, at man. the I, meatball. Yes, yes, indeed. So again, this is something that you can do with, uh, with Beyond Beef. However, if the operator just brings on the burgers, there's nothing, you know, telling you you can't flack out some burger patties and do this just the same. And this is the Beyond Meatball recipe. You don't even uh, need to introduce egg or breadcrumb as, as you might in traditional meatball recipes. You can cook these in an oven. You can cook it on a stove. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. I've cooked these uh, for a number of meat eaters. I'll keep them in a red stock pot uh, for eight hours on end. And when you form uh, that, that good brown, that good crust around um, and drop it into a liquid base, uh, that crust allows it to, to retain moisture uh, on, the, on the inside without getting soggy and breaking down. Pretty unbelievable. Uh, the next recipe we got on there is a, is a farro bowl. Um, again, you know, thinking beyond the bun, uh, when, when folks are, you know, uh, going into different dietary things, be it like a keto diet, or just trying to watch their carbs, or just tired of a burger, you know. Think of it as uh, as, as just another protein topper. So maybe it's uh, maybe it's a farro bowl where you have you know sort of your your skewer style Mediterranean style kebabs. Um, I've done bulgogi beef bowls, loco moco bowls, and and taken it into a Hawaiian spin or a taco bowl. All the above. And moving on in terms of incorporating the sausage, uh, I love doing breakfast burritos. If I had my, you know, uh, sort of my last meal, goodness, it might just be a, a loaded breakfast burrito. And whether you use our breakfast sausage patties or even uh, as this recipe talks about, you can use uh, either the sausage links as well, uh, becomes a great grab and go option. Uh, for any any type of coffee shop or uh, breakfast outlets that are looking to increase their grab and go offerings, um, as well as increasing their vegan or vegetarian offerings. And the last recipe I got on there is uh, speaks to another bowl. Uh, as I mentioned, all types of reasons uh, why why thinking beyond the bun, right? So if somebody doesn't want a um, a brat or a hot Italian link, eh, just do it as you would a, a normal pasta dish or even a pizza topper. And with that, Mr. Audet, I want to salute, sign off, and, and uh, I'll hang tight for, uh, for future questions. Excellent. Uh, you know, thank you for being very efficient and on time. I said I was uh, going to monitor the time closely to make sure that we start and finish. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. And of course, uh, I have the deck and we can share it out to uh, whoever puts a request through to, to get that out. Um, thank you very much Beautiful. for your time this morning. Uh, let's move it over to Brad and Tommy uh, from Greenleaf Foods. All right. Can you hear, me? hear us okay, Michael? Certainly can. Awesome. Well, actually, first off, I just wanted to uh, to, to thank you guys for, for hosting this event. Um, it's always a pleasure to do these type of things. And uh, I mean, this this this, this space is, is super exciting. And uh, and secondly, also to be partnered with with Beyond. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're different vendors, but you know, we're, we're kind of in this together. In, you know, in this in this space, which is here to stay, and I'll speak to that. So, you know, it's it's a pleasure being part of it with Brian. And, and Brian hit on a lot of really good points. Uh, right off the bat so so which means i won't have to go super deep on some of these so um so i'm going to walk through some of the some of the our brands our business um and i'll get a little bit more geeky on some of the facts and the trends and insights uh specifically with, within canada as well uh which applies to the group um and then uh I, tom is going to do more of the the sexy side of things with, with some of the product he's he's kind of the you know our, our, our culinary uh, visionary on the field row side of the business. So I'll let him take you through some of the cool stuff. Um, quickly myself, I've been with Maple Leaf actually um, for, for, for just under 10 years, um, the, the animal side of our business. Um, lots of confusion around the brands and who owns what and, and which brands fit you know, underneath Maple Leaf, but I'll, I'll talk you guys through that. 
it's only been about six months or so um, since I've been on the Greenleaf side of the business. Candidly, I was a plant-based guy uh, before I joined Greenleaf. Um, and so I've always had my ear to the ground and, and interested in, in, you know, facts and trying to pick up whatever I could. Uh, again, I, I just think it's, it's overall, you know, good for sustainability. Um, there's a couple of different reasons why I chose to, you know, to, to go a plant-based route. So Steve, I'm happy to hear your, your vision of, of the one year is going well, the baked potato, I mean, but, uh, for the most part, it's, uh, it's nice to see. Um, but, uh, I'm pumped to be on the Greenleaf side of the business. Um, just because uh, again, I think it's super exciting. I think it's here to stay. And, uh, and uh, there's so much variety as Brian hit on earlier. There's a ton of variety out there and there's much, much more coming. I'm sure if he could share what they're working on, uh, you know, like ourselves, there's lots of really cool stuff. So with that, um, really th this slide, I'm not gonna spend too much time on. Um, Maple Leaf obviously with his vision of being, you know, sustainable and, and, and now the announcement of being, um, you know, the, um, the first carbon neutral protein company in the world. Uh, obviously plant-based protein has a big part of that. Um, and so that's why um, recently, you know, we, we kind of ventured off and, and, and acquired Field Roast, which has typically been a West Coast um, um, U.S. brand, uh, a little more artisanal. I'll talk to you shortly on that. And then Light Life, which is, you know, kind of known initially for Tempeh. They're amalgamated um, um, to, to under Greenleaf, which is underneath Maple Leaf. So people are often curious about our branding and, you know, do we represent with Greenleaf or with Light Life or with Field Roast? Typically in the market, you're going to see it under Light Life and Field Roast, but they're both uh, underneath Greenleaf and then underneath Maple Leaf, uh, which gives us a lot of commercialization power. Obviously, that's really, really important in the food service industry is being able to commercialize. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick lay of our land. If you go to the next slide, perfect. Um, for the most part, uh, I think Light Life <clears throat> has a lot of, um, a, a lot, a much more, I wouldn't say a lot of, because that's definitely one of the things we have to work on. You'll see in future slides, but uh, Light Life, in terms of brand awareness, it's much more out there. Um, the Light Life Burger and things like that. It's funny, Light Life actually started as a tempeh company over 40 years ago. And tempeh is that, you know, funny fermented tofu that people are unsure about because it has, you know, what they deem as mold or bacteria growth on it. But it's actually a prebiotic and probiotic. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's healthy in that sense. And it's much less processed than, say, tofu or some of the other ones. Um, but Light Life started that uh, over 40 years ago in the, in the East Coast. And now it's kind of expanded. Um, and the way I kind of view light life is more so, um, more so like you would dress that up in addition to a dish. So, you know, it's a burger, it's grounds, it's tempeh, it's things like that. Uh, where you pivot and look at field roast, which has typically been our West Coast brand, um, much more um, flavor forward, very artisanal, um, things like that, but much less brand awareness, candidly. I mean, you have someone like Beyond and Impossible, I mean, and they've done amazing things within the plant-based space. And so... Um, you'll see, you'll see as we move on to, to future slides, there's some work we have to do there on that. But for the most part, those are our two, our two brands. Um, you can flip it to the next slide. So one of the things that we've done recently, and, and it's really important is, is to kind of understand the market, um, and to understand our, our, our consumer and who is our core consumer. Um, you guys obviously will make believe quite well. You probably know us a lot better than, than say green leaf and our products, um, from the red hot to the juicy jumbo, et cetera. Um, I spent lots of time on the hot dog business before I came here, so uh, uh, I have lots of secrets on that business. But one thing we did a few years ago was actually some demand space work with uh, with a consulting group and to kind of understand kind of, you know, why shoppers are shopping in certain sections and, and kind of who our core consumer is. And with that, we kind of like siphoned off and had Maple Leaf brand become natural. Schneider's became very savory and gourmet. And then we had uh, a quick fix demand space. Um, and so this is kind of similar to that. So really it's, it's more about, you know, um, getting out there and talking to people and, and, and kind of like figuring out who our core consumers are and things like that. And then there's a bunch of other questions and things we pose to people as we did this study, um, well over 10,000 people total, but the biggest one that jumps off this page and don't read this in detail guys, cause it'll straighten your eyes. But the biggest one will probably wouldn't surprise you too much is that, you know, we, we have relatively low brand awareness. In this category, you know, in regards to, or you know, in comparison to like Beyond or Impossible or things like that. So that's when we really have to. Product-wise, we're there, but we really have to move forward. This is a much more exciting slide, and again, um, Brian hit on it with his slides in terms of health. Really, is is first and foremost. I mean, I don't think that would surprise anybody on this. Um, you know, th this is kind of broken down to an average of forty-four percent, say, um, of the of the um, of the people po um, polled. You know, which is a combination of people who are already existing use meat. So 47% are users 
or 41% are considerers, right? So they're not necessarily plant-based just yet, they're considering it. So an average of 44% are healthier than meat. You can see the top reasons there, which would kind of be similar to, to, uh, to Brian's as well. The one that really, for me, jumps off this page is, and it surprised me, because typically what you think of is you think of health, you think of uh, environmental, sustainable, and then uh, ethic, ethical. This one, the one for me is, is, um, is that it adds variety to the diet. You know, that's one thing that we often don't think about when we think about plant-based meat alternatives. It's more health and things like that. So to see to see variety uh, on there is really exciting. And then also um, safer than meat. That's one that, that caught my eye as well. I mean, if you think about it, it, it makes sense in terms of food safety and preparation and things like that. But uh, but yeah, you guys can can dive into this again. I don't think this would surprise anybody too much, but this is kind of you know what we learned when we did our studies. So then kind of you pivot and say, okay, well then what's happening in the market? The question that we would often get, and, and, and you know, Brian gets this too, is, is, is um, you know, it's just, it's just a fad, you know, kind of like, you know, Tybo, the shake weight, you know, those things like, you know, something that's gonna last for a year and then they're gonna be gone. Um, I, see, I see Steve smiling. I think he might have a shake weight in the background there. Uh, I, know Graham, I know Graham does Tybo in his spare time, but anyway, uh, you know, for, for the most part, um, there's a lot of concern around if I adopt this to my menu, is this something going to be short term? Do I really want to get that invested in it or do I just ride it out and then let the animal protein wave kind of kick back in again? Really, and that comes down to understanding who your core consumers are, um, you know, and, and similar to what we saw previously in the previous slides, um, you know, millennials, you know, Gen X and Gen Z, they make up roughly 62% of the American population, guys. So, I mean, and they are the future. They are the ones who are our core consumers of plant-based space. Not to say that the boomers are not. Uh, it's just that for the most part, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing the majority of our consumption from the millennials, um, Gen X and Gen Z. And, and let, like I said, let's face it, they're 62% of our population for the most part, depending on where you look. Um, that's well, one point. And then the second point really is when you poll people, on average, like over one point that to me that speaks is is um, sixty percent of respondents actually hoped that this would be permanent, or 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 intended that it would be permanent. So again, they're in, you know th these core consumers who are the majority of the population are intending this to stay in their menu. So when you look at that, what we're kind of seeing, and you can you could argue these figures, but this is pretty much global plant based meat guys, right? So this is you know you know obviously global, not North American, not not Canadian. We're going to get there shortly. But uh, for the most part, you can see the average growth rate, you know, be compounded. It's roughly 15% a year. So by the time we get to 2026, you're talking about a $31 billion industry globally. So this, you know, there's definitely some staying power here and mainly because our core consumers are the future. Um, that's why we kind of believe it's here to stay. So, and then if you look at, if you double click a little bit more, so a little bit more relevant to this group is like, is, is Canada. Right, so we all we're all concerned about within Canada. How does that apply? Sometimes you show stats and things for the U.S. or for global. And people say that's great. How does it apply to Canada? Um, so these numbers are actually directly from um, from DirectLink. So they're food service numbers. The retail consumption numbers, guys, from Retail Link are actually more impressive than this. But this is directly from your industry. Okay, so really, I don't again don't think this would surprise anybody. But you know, for the most part, BC Ontario make up you know the lion's share of the of the total. Um, um, plant-based meat alternative um, pop or share within Canada, 24% and 32%. But to me, the, the biggest things on these slides and what I would leave you guys with is just look at the growth across the board. You're talking about 106% over the last 52 weeks in BC alone, you know, uh, and Quebec, 110%. The the other thing on this slide, which uh, I for a second, you know, for a second I had to double take when I, when I pulled the numbers was was um, not so much the prairies and 18% share, but the, the growth rate in the prairies is, is substantial. It's actually the third highest on here. And there's a lot of talk obviously of, you know, that that's for the most part farming territory and country and, and, and you know, there shouldn't be as much growth in that area. But like, as you can see, there's a, there's a ton of growth across the board. It doesn't matter what region you're in. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not only, you know, are the growth expectations high per my previous slide, but um, we're seeing it pay off or we're seeing it happen to materialize within Canada. So, and you can move it along. So then really, okay, so what does that come down to in the market? So how does this represent it in the market? You know, um, to me, like I said er earlier, like um, our brands are important. Every brand that's in this plant-based space is important. Um, and so, you know, any awareness is good awareness for, for this category and you're gonna see a ton of it. And you're not just gonna see it in Canada. 
uh, and not just in the US. Kind of what we see for the most part is China, Australia, UK um, are kind of leading the charge in terms of actually, you know, plant-based meat alternatives on the menu, either in a testing format or full-time. Um, you know, there are other countries in the world and who are getting involved, but for the most part, a lot of what you see in the news, guys, is going to be um, in these countries. Uh, and then, of course, obviously Canada. You know, there's been a ton of a, a ton of uh, exciting things out there recently. From you know, KFC, Light Life at KFC. You know, um, we tested the NW Nuggets for a while. Um, the Plantiful at Wendy's, things like that. There's a ton of stuff out there now that you're going to see. You know, much much more coming. Uh, I would say without to share too much, probably in the next eight weeks, there's a lot of good stuff happening within Canada. Uh, and before I pass it over to Tommy, before I flip back, before I pass it over to Tommy, um, one of the things that we're noticing, if you look at this slide, it's not necessarily all about the burger. I mean, the burger obviously kind of put put plant-based on the map and that's for the most part, you know, it's a, it's a bit of an easier animal protein to replicate. Um, getting chicken right and things like that, pepperoni is much, much tougher. Um, but as you can see, there's lots of things happening in that space. So where, whereas the the beef, the meat, the uh, burger market's kind of gone like this quickly, it's sort of leveling off a little bit. And really, what we see for the future, um, just if I could share a little bit with you guys, is actually, you know, more around these these other alternative proteins like chicken, which has you know probably the most global versatility when you think about certain cultures that wouldn't consume pork or beef or things like that. Chicken is, and that's why chicken, animal protein chicken, is actually one of the fastest growing proteins and has been since the 70s. So that's where we're going to see some really creative things, I would say, in the next year or so. You're already seeing it, depending on where you live. Um, and then other things like, um, you know, we, how do we get the pizza chains involved and things like that? So there's so much cool stuff on here and not just tied to the burger. So if you really, if I hand it off to Tommy, so then it comes down to how does it apply to the menu? You know how do how do we get it to you guys and and, and onto the you know to the operators menus and things like that. So if I'll flip it forward, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Tommy now because to be honest, Tommy's got all the sexy part of this stuff. Um, mine's just more the facts to help reinforce why it's so important to have have this um, on menus and things. But Tommy, if you can hear me, I'll I'll pass it over to you and I'll let you walk yep, through some of these slides. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I certainly okay. can. All right. So, uh, let's see, my name's Tommy McDonald. I'm our director of culinary at, at Greenleaf Foods. I, uh, I started with field roast, I think probably about eight years now. And I've worn, worn a few different hats, but <clears throat> in selling plant protein, it's always been really important to, uh, to be able to, to kind of be one part teacher in, in the kitchen. And I think that, uh, some of it is, is just, is just getting chefs and back house staff inspired to use the product. Um, it was an uphill battle when we started, right? Because the, the veggie burgers and veggie dogs that everyone we're used to, uh, it's it's far cry from what we're what we're working with now. So um, that that being said, we 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 have a huge uh, portfolio of products between the two brands, um, and I like to approach them from an ingredient perspective right i'm i'm i am beyond the bun Im, embodied right everybody knows how to make a cheeseburger i don't need to show them how to do that so um my my approach is to uh is to, is to keep things really simple right it's got to get it's got to get on the menu and and like michael was uh there's potential for some for some serious uh uh, uh savings i i think using plant-based proteins um so going to the first dish that we did, this is one from from the book, uh, and it's and focus on something that wasn't going to blow up uh, your your pantry, something you wouldn't have to bring in a bunch of bunch of specialty items uh, uh, to make. So uh, we just did a simple stuffed tomato. So what we're using is the is the field roast Italian sausage crumble, which is if you've ever seen it, um, it's it's chock full of whole fennel seeds. We use fresh garlic. We use red wine, uh, and and it's also got fresh eggplant in it. So it's it, it it's got a great, uh, a classic Italian flavor, um, but it it really plant perspective. We're really showcasing uh, the the actual plant-based ingredients in, in kind of their whole form, right? 
So, um, so we've taken the ground, we, we're stuffing it in a, a simple tomato, uh, a little bit of roasted veggies, and then and we just do a simple um, little little tomato broth underneath. Uh, or you could do a little marinara, uh, drop it in into a skillet or or a bakeable dish um, with a little breadcrumb on top, and and then just finish under the salamander. And it's you know it's something that's that that meat eaters are going to recognize. Um, and with the uh, with the mouthfeel of the product, the Italian sausage when it's when it's cooked into the the tomato like this, it's such a familiar experience. You aren't even you aren't even thinking about it being plant based. It's it's something that everybody's going to like, right? So, um, <clears throat> and of course, these are low low cost ingredients that already exist in your pantry. So it's not throwing a wrench in your back of house operations. Uh, Michael, you want to skip ahead? Next slide. Okay, so here's one that I think you could either utilize as a bowl or you could showcase as kind of like a an entree dish that that's got some flair, right? Something that you're going to see at the next table over, and and that's what you're going to order. Um, and it's a plant -based. yeah. And I think, uh, this this is a nice creative approach because we're multiple proteins, um, but but we're approaching it from different ways. So we're using the Mexican chipotle field roast sausage as our chorizo. Um, grill it up, slice it up, and lay it on top of that saffron rice. And then as a scallop, uh, I use a king trumpet uh, mushroom stock. And I cut it into, into scallop size coins. Just do a little scoring on top. Either soak it in a little bit of salt water or just a little salt and pepper oil on top and then sear them off. Um, a little grilled tomato. And obviously the rice has got whatever fixings you like to work into your paella rice. Um, and like I said, you could do it as a bowl, top it with all kinds of different vegetables, uh, sub out different proteins, um, or, or you can do it as that really nice uh, presentable entree that comes out. And this is something that it's, it's going to drive curiosity, right? You see the, the scallops, you're like, oh, OK, well, I thought this was plant-based. Well, those are, those are mushrooms. Well, that's cool. I want to try that. And there's the chorizo that that kind of plays on that uh, that flavor profile. Like, well, I got to try a little heat with it, and and then the rice and everything kind of comes together, it, it, and you're really driving curiosity, which is going to get, it's going to pull that meat eater in. Um, you look at the dish, you're like, it's striking, right? It's something that that you want to try. So, uh, you want to skip to the next one, Michael? Now, <clears throat> Brad mentioned tempeh, um, and I. I'm all about tempeh right now. Um, we do a really cool tempeh product uh, that's, a, that's a substitute for bacon. So we take the tempeh, we slice it thin, and then we treat it with like a smoky bacon marinade. Uh, I like to deep fry it. I think that's the best way to do it, but you can also pan fry it or, or roast it in, in a high heat oven. But it, it's, it's not, you're not gonna have the, the fat and sinewy bacon experience. You get the crispy, you get the sweet, and you get the smoky, uh, but but then you don't all you don't have the negatives of the saturated fat, and, and we're a lot lower on sodium, um, and of course we've got that plant-based halo, uh, that health halo around what we're doing. So um, we use it on a on a BLT sandwich. Um, so you fry them up crispy, and then and then you just make your sandwich as you would, right? A little bit of mayo, a little bit of lettuce, tomato, um, and this is something that that you could prepackage to go. You could do as like a 12, 13, $14 sandwich with a side. Um, and you could do it on thick cut bread, make it really like a, a deluxe sandwich. You could load it up a big, big chunky tomato slice. Um, but this is, this is a, a really easy sandwich. Again, ing ingredients that are already in your pantry. Um, and that's that tempeh, just finding creative ways to get it on the menu. Um, with all of the health benefits that come along with eating tempeh, I think is is a slam dunk. Once we start communicating that message and, and how healthful that that tempeh is, um, you want to skip to the next one, please. These are all excellent recipes. If you can, just try to speak up just a little bit more. It's just a little bit hard to hear you. Maybe the mo sure. phone is moving around, or you're not like. Sure. But uh, otherwise, the what I'm seeing so far is absolutely delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's summer. I love pizza, but I don't want to heat up the house, right? 
Uh, so I like to grill pizza, but I think this is something that works great in restaurants that have grills. It looks complicated. Uh, it looks like it could be potentially messy, but it's really, really, really easy to do. You just roll the dough out, get that grill piping hot, a little bit of oil um, on, the, on the rolled out dough. You lay the naked dough down right onto the grill and you kind of toast it like you were grilling like a pita or something. Um, you get one side toasted, flip it over, set the raw side just for a second, pull that dough off, top it. And with this one, we did our field roasted uh, Italian sausage crumble again, um, because I think it's just perfect on pizza applications. And if you do bring it in, use it in, in the pantry, you can use it for all kinds of stuff, right? It, anywhere you would sub in it, Italian sausage. So, and then we're, and we're, we're putting on goat cheese. Obviously you could sub in a, a plant-based uh, soft cheese or, or harder cheese. There's a lot of really excellent ones. We make a nice one, it's called chow cheese. Um, and then some, some pickled peppers. Um, we get the Mama Lil's in, in Seattle too. They're excellent. Uh, simple tomato sauce. Um, and then you just return it to the grill just for a minute and, and let those kind of, let the sauce set, the ingredients kind of warm up uh, and then pull it off, slice it on a board. And then it's a beautiful presentation, nice charred dough. Um, and, and you're doing pizza where maybe you don't have, a, you even have a pizza oven, but you've got a grill in the back and you can turn this out as, as a pizza or a flatbed, flatbread. Maybe it's on the appetizer menu. Uh, you want to skip ahead, please? Now, this one I'm working with our, our uh, Light Life Ground, which I think is a, is a super cool product um, because it's a cook from raw. So historically, We've done a lot of ready-to-eat stuff, um, products that are you can eat right out of the package. Um, they're fully cooked in, 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 in the process uh, of making them, and, and uh, this line of products is a departure from that. So it's the cooked from raw. It's the, it's the trendy colored uh, uh, meat that looks a lot like ground beef. Um, so what I did for this is I love beef stroganoff. <laughs> it's like a guilty pleasure. Uh, so, so I thought... Well, you can take stroganoff a bunch of different directions. You can do it like down home mom style where, where it's just like loaded up with sour cream and, and, and egg noodles and, and what have you. Um, or you can elevate it, right? And, and like do a nice uh, pappardelle pasta um, and then sear off this ground with the mushrooms. Um, and then I cut in, you can cut in, you can cut in cream. Uh, we, we also do a, uh, we, like I said, we have a plant-based cheese. You can do that with a, a little bit of plant-based milk and kind of make uh, a nice creamy sauce with that. Um, the classic peas uh, to finish, and I always do a little bit of Worcestershire sauce in mine. And there's a there's a really nice, uh, or actually there's a few vegan Worcestershire sauces out there that I I would say are superior to the uh, the the regular version. So um, don't be scared of those products either. And that that might be our last recipe. I'm not sure. Is there another one after that? That was it. Okay. Well, that's that's all I got. I, I appreciate um, the time and the opportunity, but I'll pass it back over. Uh, I'm, I'm passing it to you, Brad. Yeah, I'll just finish off and, and thank you for that, Tommy. I, <laughs> Tommy definitely brings the creativity side to it for our business. I often call him and, and, and run ideas by him, and, and uh, when we're talking to operators, he's often my go-to guy just because uh, he's got that that culinary background. Um, we don't have to spend time on this. This is in the appendix. This is just more, a little bit more of an eyesore slide, but it just helps support some of the facts that we talked about earlier. And then uh, the last one really is just around, um, I, I thought I'd include it, because people often ask that, okay, so where, when we buy plant-based or when my consumer comes in and orders plant-based, where's that coming from? And so the last slide, and again, you can look at it on your own time, but really like, is it bringing in new users or are we just trading down, uh, you know, uh, somebody's going to come in and buy a steak, right? And so for the most part, what we see um, in the retail side of things, where we can get a little bit more granular on consumption data and things like that, um, is roughly we see about 30% new users into the category, not just, not just cannibalizing from existing business on the animal side. So you're not necessarily going to trade down your, 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 uh, your consumer. You're just bringing that new user in who probably wouldn't try it previously. And typically what we see is, you know, whatever kind of plays out in retail, it's very similar on the food service side of things. So, you know, we're seeing about a third in terms of new users come in in the category. So I'll just leave you guys with that.
that was the new user slide. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing some really great information insights. I know that uh, when we see these slide presentations or decks, uh, there tends to be a lot of information on the slides uh, to digest. Uh, certainly nothing that you could uh, do in the in that 30 minute presentation to to do it justice, but certainly we can share the presentation deck out and we can also share contact information uh, for the teams at both of these companies uh, to reach out and find out anything that uh, you may have some questions. Uh, I'm going to stop the PowerPoint portion of it now. Uh, so we're going to move into our panel discussion. I know Manel and Ben and Steve are sitting there patiently waiting for the last hour, but uh, we're certainly going to get to, to you next. Um, I do want to frame it up a little bit, uh, you know, where we sort of got to this, because I was originally just going to go with, um, you know, having Beyond and Light Life on. Uh, Steve and I were having a conversation a couple of weeks ago, or sorry, just at the beginning of July. Um, and it really got me talking and thinking. Uh, and then Steve had mentioned uh, Grounds and Greens, and I made a couple quick phone calls, and you know, here, here we are today. Um, Steve, uh, you know, I've worked with Steve for nearly more than 15 years now. I think you've been with Cisco for more than 15. Um, and you know steve is you know a traditional eater if you would uh and then when he came in one day and said that uh he was going vegan i said yeah right we'll see you in a couple of weeks uh bellying up to the meat table to to get your fix on a future friday um and he's he's stayed with it and it's very impressive and some of our conversation you know sort of centered around uh some of the challenges of dining out and i'll let steve uh, speak to that more when I ask the question. Uh, and then we have uh, Manel and Ben from Grounds and Greens. Um, the sort of like in the couple of days that the world was blowing up, uh, we had this customer coming into the culinary center to, uh, you know, looking for some pictures of their plated dishes so that they can get their restaurant uh, up and running. Uh, so back in March and you know, I honestly, through the entire photo shoot, never dawned on me for one inkling of a second, and I didn't know that their menu was going to be 100% plant ba plant based. the The food coming out was delicious. I snacked through it the day uh, on on some of the offerings that they had in in sort of the whirlwind of time uh, that we had to get there and and get some pictures out to you. And thank you. You used some of my pictures on your website and uh and, and i noticed them in your google my business as well uh so it's very exciting to see that uh not only uh you know have you chosen cisco to be your your business partner that you are up and running uh and you know going after this uh, market segment and i'll let you uh speak to it a little bit more uh, but i've put together a couple of structured questions and then maybe we can uh, get a couple of people joining in first. Uh, so my first question will be for Steve, and you guys can unmute yourselves if uh, you want at this point, so you don't have to fumble with the buttons or anything. Uh, Steve, you've chosen to lead a vegan lifestyle uh, that you've been committed to for the last nine months. Uh, I did say that I am quite impressed, uh, but what led you uh, to choosing this vegan lifestyle? No. no. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. The, the first thing I did is many of you may be aware of heard of a movie called The Game Changers. So I watched that movie. Um, one of my coworkers suggested that I watch it. The very next day, I told myself I'm going to try it. And if you do watch the movie, and I don't know if I get any for the or anything for this, but at minute 22, this movie is when the doctor um, tests the blood of three professional athletes. And, and what he found after eating one meat-filled meal is that their blood was really, really, really dirty, or it appeared to be. And that led me to believe, being someone who's only eating protein, is that that's what my diet primarily made up of. What was I doing to my body? So it started out as a health thing. And then as my journey 
went on. People asked me why, how. Thought I was like Michael, crazy. No way I was going to pull through it because I've been through a lot of the different fads and the called fads, diets, lifestyle changes, and, and truly it is a lifestyle. And and as I went along, more and more people started asking me how, wanting to know why, and and if I was truly still eating 100% plants. And uh, it, it's been wonderful. I have energy that I've never had before. So I, I don't know if I, I'm not, again, like Michael said, trying to convert people, but every person that I talk to that, that has gone down this lifestyle has the same level of passion towards. And, and it's a feeling you have that you can't explain unless you, you have experienced it. So. Excellent. The, um, the particular, it's like a documentary or, you know, uh, I forget what they call them, uh, sort of entertainment documentary. Uh, Game Changers is about uh, an MMA athlete who had suffered, um, I think, the third, um, you know, sort of catastrophic injury. Uh, and it, part of his road to recovery was adopting uh, a plant-based lifestyle. Uh, which leads into the documentary about uh, some testing and things uh, that they did with with athletes. Uh, but it is it certainly is an interesting uh, documentary. Of course, there there probably is. You're looking at it through one person's lens in the story that uh, that they're guiding you through. But uh, I did watch it, and that uh, is an interesting documentary. Uh, Manel and Ben, again, congratulations on opening uh, Grounds and Greens. Um, I did allude to that uh, even though it doesn't say it, really say it in big, bold letters on your website uh, that you are a plant-based uh, restaurant, uh, that you opened up in the heart of White Rock, uh, not in the city of Vancouver, where you would typically think where that demographic is. Um, how has the community received you so far? Well, it's, it's been kind of surprising. We've been open for about two months now and uh, the community has received us extremely well. They've been super supportive and extremely welcoming. But like the main reason we wanted to do it was uh, we're kind of selfish, right? We're both chefs and we're always working with meats and dairies and all the animal products. And we kind of wanted to get away with uh, away from that as a family. So we've been trying to be vegan for the last 10 years, but in our line of work, it's been a little difficult. So that's why we decided to open up this uh, plant-based cafe. It was mainly for ourselves so that we can <laughs> practice what we want to preach, right? But, you know, like all in all, it's been extremely amazing to see the reaction from uh, the community. Uh, we were actually surprised of the number of uh, vegan families in the area. We thought there would be like maybe like two dozen families, maybe. But surprisingly, there's so many more. So you can see that this... Uh, this plant-based lifestyle is definitely on the increase and it's definitely here to stay. Excellent. Uh, Steve, what kind of challenges do you and your family face when uh, choosing to dine out? We talked about this yesterday and Steve's like, we don't dine out. I don't know how to answer the question. And I said, yes, you do know how to answer the question. Steve, what, even if you if it's not just your family, just yourself when you're on the road, looking for a quick bite, what what are the challenges that you do face? Um, number one is being confident in what I'm getting, you know, understanding when I order something um, that it's going to be within my, what I, what I choose to eat. Um, and then basically it comes down to the staff being knowledgeable about what they have. So for instance, if I'm to order a burger, is the bun plant-based or does it have dairy products in it? And often that question throws kitchens and restaurants for a loop or has in the past where if they had to answer that really quickly, it would raise my confidence in, in what I would be receiving. If that makes sense. It, it, it does. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a very easy oversight and it's the attention to detail uh, that is so important. And I recall seeing this uh, when, when the, when the gluten-free fad came out, uh, who knew that that would be here to stay um, uh, that, you know, somebody would ask for 
uh, an option to be gluten free. And, you know, I recall a soup coming out and there being a crouton placed on top of the soup. Here's the gluten free soup, uh, but there's a crouton sitting right on the very top uh, as the decoration. So just it's sometimes it's those little uh, attention to detail uh, where the biggest opportunity uh, when adding plant based or, or anything like that uh, would be for your menu. Um, Manel, uh, you know, tell me a little bit more about why, uh, you know, Ben alluded to it a little bit, but I know that there's a little bit of a deeper story. You know, why did you uh, decide to open a vegan concept or plant based right. concept? Pardon me. So like what Ben was saying, you know, for the last 10 or so years, we've been on and off vegan. And because we are working with animal products at work, it was really hard to kind of stick with it. Uh, but um, 18 months ago, we did um, become a family of three. And when our son Ollie was born, we really wanted to make that shift um, to a plant based lifestyle completely. Uh, so um, we knew that during my mat leave, I was like, okay, I'm going to go back to work and I'm going to go back to eating meat again. Um, and we really did some, we, we sat down and kind of talked it out. And the only way that we could ever com fully commit to this lifestyle as chefs, as professional chefs, was if we were to open up our own place and, and, and open up a plant-based cafe. Because um, even though I was, we were vegan uh, during work, we would still have to eat, taste, touch all these animal products. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that that was out of the picture. And so uh, we opened our, our own place and here we are. You mentioned chefs where, tell me a little bit more about uh, the chef backgrounds that each of you have. Sure. So I started with uh, the Four Seasons Hotel. So uh, I started in Four Seasons Vancouver. Um, and then both Ben and I transferred over to Europe. So we spent about six years in Ireland and two years in the UK. Um, and that's kind of when, when we were living in the UK is kind of when we started going vegan. Because we saw this documentary, just like how Steve did, we saw a documentary <laughs> Uh, forks over knives. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but that's what switched because um, my grandma was was sick at the time, and so I was like, oh no, I need to. I took, I we literally took garbage bags and emptied out our fridge and freezer and threw away or gave it away um, all of our animal products uh, in the house, and we completely went uh, vegan in a matter of an hour. Right after the movie, we're like, we're vegan. Um, so that lasted about a year. And then, you know, because again, we were traveling, we were cooking meat, um, we could stick to it. So we would always be plant-based or vegan at home, but never at work. So, or when you travel or when you eat out, like you said, Steve, you know, it is harder uh, to eat out, but I think nowadays it is getting much, much easier. Uh, but so, so yeah, that was kind of um, our background. and. Over the last six years, I was with Cactus Club Cafe, um, and that's kind of where I learned all my business acumen um, and how to run a business and how to open up a restaurant because I was part of um, the opening team within the with the company. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about our background. Fun, fantastic, um, Steve. You know, from again, from approaching from a different sort of lens, you know, that distributor side and. Um, you know, working for Cisco, if you have any advice for chefs or owners about adding uh, vegan menu items or plant-based menu items, I keep trying not to say vegan, but I keep uh, falling back on it, plant-based items, uh, what advice would that be? I, I would say keep it simple. Um, having plant-based items on your menu doesn't need to change your identity or who you are. It just needs to fit into what you do. So if you're a pasta place, just have options and, and advertise it. What you have, like use social media too. Uh, that's where I find most of my stuff. I follow a lot of people on Instagram that um, are plant-based and they have a lot of recipes, local people. Um, and that's where I get my ideas to make my own food. So if it's not on there, I don't know about it. How am I going to come to your restaurant expecting to eat there or how will I make that one of our choices if we don't know it's available that's a that's a great answer very simple to the point well done 
Um, and I'd open up that uh, question to the to the rest of the panel. Brad, Tommy, Brian, uh, thoughts on on any advice that you might have. T Tommy, you've been involved in, in obviously working in restaurants and things uh, before coming to Greenleaf. Is there anything I might defer to you on this one, just given your experience? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Is there anything you could suggest or recommend? I'd say Steve hit it the nail on the head. I mean, keep it simple. Don't don't try and uh, don't deliver one for one. All I think all the time is a is a good thing to focus on too. So you may be able to deliver the experience of a Reuben sandwich without perfectly mimicking the corned beef by like having the crusty toasted bread, having the melty plant based cheese, the the thousand island or kraut, uh, and then whatever you're using for, for your corned beef, whether it's like a corn uh, mushroom slice or, or some type of marinated mushrooms or, or, or like a marinated seitan, uh, it doesn't have to be one for one. If you set out to, to, to try and just uh, uh, mimic something, you're never, you're never going to hit it right on, right? So you just want to deliver on that experience. I, I think that's, a, that's something that I focus on. And, and that supports also the what we saw in the data, which is all about variety, right? Like customers and consumers are looking for variety and not necessarily just, just to have the exact same thing, but in a plant-based space. And the, the other thing I would, I would, I would second with Steve's comment was actually just the education is, is, is really key. Uh, just knowing the products, feeling comfortable with it, obviously trying it in advance and knowing what you're getting, how it tastes, so you can get your own point of view on it. I mean, really, let's be honest, like passion is key, right? So if you, if you have the passion to, to really want to sell it, then that goes a long way. People can see that. Um, if you're just kind of reading off a script or you're just kind of repeating something verbatim, it's a little less impactful. So knowing the product, having the passion, um, and then like Tommy said, you know, not trying to mimic one for one, I think that's probably your, your, best, day, your best foot forward. Um, and uh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to kind of salute everybody's answers. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll go to a pizza operator and, and they'll ask, all right, so do we need a specialty vegan pie on there with a vegan cheese and a cauliflower crust? I go, sure. You know, if you have a, a demographic that supports it. But in all honesty, um, you know, if somebody wants to have uh, Beyond Crumbles on a pizza uh, with bacon, with actual cheese, uh, ultimately, that's that's their prerogative, and by simply having this as an option, um, it allows it to become uh, sort of modular, and they can incorporate it into any dish that they want. Excellent. I would uh, I would add to this conversation by saying, you know, you don't need to bring in a whole bunch of different products to add one or two items to your menu. Uh, look at the depth of what your current menu is uh, and, and find those opportunities without having to to bring in a whole bunch of product. And I think that uh, you probably find a, a lot of options uh, that are out there that can get uh, that certainly can get you going uh, and then you know make sure that you're analyzing uh, your sales and and look for opportunities. Michael, if I could also add, um... Talk to your marketing associate. They, they can get you a list of every single item that you currently purchase from Cisco that is vegan. And then also a list of every item that's within our warehouse that is vegan as well, or plant-based, sorry, I use that word. But uh, we, we, ha we have a number of items, and I didn't, I've been working with Cisco for over 14 years, and I, and I didn't know we had any available options, so. All right. Uh, the next question is for Manel and Ben. Um, you know, we just saw a couple of presentations from supplier partners. We know that there are a lot of products, uh, certainly some ready to eat and some prepare from a raw state. Uh, you know, with the with the amount of growth and potential, we know that the manufacturers are going to find ways to fit those products in. Uh, but I truly believe it. It's chefs and food service that are going to take these products and elevate them. Um, what, you know, knowing that you've just developed a menu, 
and you're probably going to be looking for the next couple of steps. Uh, what's your approach to evaluating new products? Well, I think for us, the, the, the key thing is quality, right? If the quality is there and it's going to be what the manufacturer is delivering, then I think that's going to be the thing that's going to like paramount everything, right? After that, is, is it going to fit into our concept? And then, of course, value. Is there value in adding this into our menu? So those are kind of like the three ways we evaluate it. Yeah, because I think our approach as chefs has not changed even after, you know, we became plant based. I think like Ben was saying, quality is the number one key, whether you're a steak eater or a plant based eater. It has it has to do everything. Everything is about quality. Uh, so you can have the most elaborate dish, but have a subpar um, ingredient. It's not going to, you know, this, the ingredient speaks for itself. And a chef, we're just here to kind of you know, change the flavor, add different textures, enhance, um, enhance the flavors. That's all we really do as chefs. Um, we don't try to change a tomato into a pasta. You know, we're not trying to do anything like that. We're just trying to be a little bit more creative. Like I said, different textures um, and, and really play with your palate in terms of like spice, salty, sour. Um, so those are the things that kind of um, excite your palate and we try to incorporate that within our dishes. Um, so if you if you go on our website and you look at our menu, it does look a little bit complicated because we do have a lot of items on each dish, but that is so every bite kind of tingles that sensor sense in your mouth that's like, oh that one's really spicy or or that one's really sweet and savory. So that's kind of what we try to do with with all of our dishes um, and on our menu. But then you also notice that, like, if you look at the menu, it's all uh, whole plant-based items, right? Nothing's been overly processed or or done to the extreme where you don't even recognize what that plant was, right? So that's what we try to do: keep it simple, keep it fresh, and make sure the quality is there. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, and then same thing to the rest of the panel. Um, you know, I know that you know a lot of R and D comes. You don't just make products on the fly. Uh, there's certainly recipe components and, and thought put into it. Um, what what's some of your processes? Uh, we'll start with Tommy. For for us, uh, at, at least on the field roast side, we've always focused on traditional approaches. So so using techniques that already exist and may be um, primarily used for for animal proteins, right? Um, but we're using that that same method and utilizing utilizing plant-based ingredients, um, and I think that that helps to to deliver um, on, on on texture uh, that paired with quality ingredients, right? But in that sense, you there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's you know hundreds of years of food technology that's that's out there to be to be utilized, um, and, and, and so. Yeah, I think that's that's been our approach to it, um, and I think it's really paid dividends on the field row side. Um, yes, and building off of that, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll get the question from the operator, oh, how am I supposed to cook this? And my sort of canned quick answer is, well, you know, how do you normally cook ground beef? How do you normally do a link sausage, you know? Uh, do you do you take a hockey puck out of your out of your freezer and, and do you put it on a grill? No, it's not as juicy. Uh, absolutely, you know, slack it out. Uh, do it as you would normal ground beef. And uh, I think the other part of that process, uh, you know, keep keep going back to demystifying this vegan word, right? Uh, as Michael, you know, keeps trying to keep it out of his mouth. Um, people think it inherently has to be complicated. Uh, we we try and keep even our manufacturing process as simple as possible. That's you know that uh, alludes back to you know sort of our slide on on the ingredients that go into it. So um, just making that that hurdle that barrier to entry for somebody you know saying all right I'm going to have a plant based meal for the day, making it as simple and easy to replicate as possible. Excellent, and I know that. Uh... I have uh, Graham and Gord Campbell um, on the line. Uh, both have been, uh, you know, long careers in the food service industry. Um, what are your thoughts around that question? 
Well, Michael, uh, I think one of the, uh, in regards to that question, it's about, it's a combination of taking the technology as Tommy had alluded to and, and, but creating something that has a degree of versatility for the operators. It has, you know, the right ingredients, it has the versatility, it has applications across the board. And one of the things that Tommy illustrated really well in the deck, as you probably noticed, is the contribution and capabilities of the products. And when you look at all the components built together and how it can bring to the menu, but for the products themselves, it's about listening to the customers, keeping it cool, creating versatility in what in the marketplace, and uh, and and listening to what they see for their needs and applications. Um, that's what I've seen so far. Can I mention get your staff to try the food? Uh, yes, the pre-shift tasting. So, taste so and and when when you're presenting your food to your staff and even to your customers, get them to try the food as a finished product, not on its own. So if you're making a burger, eat it as a burger, not as a pan, because it is different. It's not the exact same. And if you're expecting it to be the exact same, you're going to be disappointed. So, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you, Steve. It's Gordon here. The, the whole thing about plant-based, vegan, whatever you want to call it, I'm, I'm, I'm about 75% vegan and I'm uh, gluten-free. So I'm one of those, those people that Steve and I have difficulty eating in restaurants. But working in industry and cooking and doing all those fun things all my life, I've been able to look at a menu and say, hey, can't you just toss this together for me? Oh, okay, that works. Doesn't, not a lot of restaurants like to do it, but they'll do it for you. So it, simplicity is the thing and, and flavor profiles. So when you take, uh, I mean, be, talking about beyond products and you take the ground, the ground can become anything you want it to be when you're using ground beef. So you take ground beef and you know what you can do it as a chef or as a cook in a, in a restaurant. It, it's a simple application. You can turn it into balls, pizza, whatever you like. So it, it's simple. And it's one ingredient in the freezer that comes out. And I'm a big stinkler about that too. And I know that Michael and all of us and Steve, and we all try to promote that within the industry now because, you know, back in the day, you know, we, we don't have those big uh, freezers and walk-in coolers that we used to have. And now we're down to smaller spaces. Uh, if you can take one item out of the freezer and, 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 or out of your cooler from a tempered state and apply it to a number of things on your menu, that's awesome. And it gives you versatility in the factor of when you're trying to put together features on your menu. And a lot of people, you know, you can, I mean, I, I when I used to sell uh, soups, we used to have a, a vegan soup. And then I said, well, a couple of days later, you can turn that into throw some ground beef in it. Well, the same thing works with all these other things too. So a vegan product can become like your hollandaise sauce in the, in the butter world. And you can turn it into a virtue of, of a million different things. So the versatility of a, one item is the I believe is the best thing to is what we're all trying to promote here. Excellent. That uh, you know there are some really uh, really really good answers, uh, some really really good insights shared. Uh, I have been keeping my eye on the uh, chat window, um, and nothing has come up. Uh, at the moment, uh, but if anybody had any last thoughts or burning questions, you can certainly type them in now. Um, just and sort of a last uh, last question, more of a curiosity thing uh, for me. I know Steve is 100% uh, plant based. Uh, Graham, what would uh, what would you count your percentage to be? For me and myself as a consumer. Yeah. Um, I'd probably see about 20, 25%. I, I'm, as strange as it seems, I, I'm, I consume, you know, one meal, one or two meals a week where I just look at, and it's not just me try my own products. Um, getting, away from bacon, getting away from bacon is very difficult. So, so that's a double recording by Brad. Yeah, that's a double recording by Brad. <laughs> not that I'm putting anybody on the spot. Uh, but, and again, out of curiosity too, just, uh, you know, the, the reason why I'm asking this sort of at the end was just, uh, you know, I didn't want it to, to seem like we're all uh, out there to convert everybody. But uh, Brad? 
you're on mute. There you go. In terms of in terms of percentage wise, or yeah, or, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I get asked that a lot. My team actually asked that. Um, my, uh, my my uh, my mentor, my one up Ken, uh, actually asked me when he hired me from the Maple Leaf side. So I got to ask you, you know, like, you're, you're fully plant based, and and is, are you strict, and why do you do it, and what do you get out of it? Really, the simple answer is, I just kind of, um, I'm a runner, and so I just more so curious as to how it would impact or how it would affect my training, you know, would I see less inflammation? Uh, and for the most part, that is the, the sole reasons to why I got into it. Um, I find I can recover faster. I'm 10 years older than I was 10 years ago, obviously, and I can run longer and faster. I don't think that's strictly because of the diet, candidly, but I, I do believe um, I recover a lot faster. Uh, I've tested it and I've done, I'm a student of science, so I've done everything from keto um, to to paleo to, to you know, to just, you know, clean, clean, you know, clean not clean meat, that's a whole different discussion, um, but just like really, you know, like organic, you know, you know, um, farm raised meat, and then really just plant based. And so I find for the most part, I just perform better on that front. And to Steve's point, I just have less energy dips throughout the day. I just have more consistent energy. Uh, so I'm probably about 95%. I, to be honest, like, um, I don't necessarily do it for ethical reasons. I can absolutely see it uh, and I can see the environmental, but for the most part for me, it's health. Uh, if I went over to your house, Michael, and you served a steak, I would, I would, I would eat it and I would enjoy it. Like, you know, there's, there's, I think there's power in also not being too preachy about this subject. It's one that you have to be, you have to walk that very carefully. Uh, I thought the game changers to, did a really good job of actually walking that line and show, showing more scientific stuff. There's always an argument for both sides, understandably. Um, but I'm probably 95%. My wife, my lovely wife, is downstairs. Uh, she's probably about 80%. She loves her dairy. Uh, but I'm fairly confident our chow cheese, uh, which we didn't talk a whole ton about, but uh, if you get a chance to try the chow cheese, absolutely do so. It's probably one of the best marketed cheeses out there. That might convert her. So, chow, you you would never unless somebody told you, uh, you'd never know that chow was a, a vegan cheese. It's the most it's in terms of how it performs. And again, this is Tommy's world, less mine, but it. It's it performs extremely well in, in, in various formats, you know, vert shredded, uh, you know, it bakes up really well. Uh, it just it has it does the best job in terms of like a mass marketed cheese. I find candidly, um, you, you could you could buy it as a slice and shred from the from the brick. So you could use it in two different ways. Yeah, there you go, Brian. Um, so, yeah, I guess. I, when I started with Beyond in 2012, every single one of my meals definitely had some element of animal in it. Usually it was chicken, um, but, you know, on weekends, throw out a steak or a burger on the barbecue. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you fall down this sort of rabbit hole. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the name, uh, but one of the gentlemen was speaking towards sort of performance. And I, I do a lot of rock climbing. I do a lot of cycling. And I noticed that on days where, you know, as I started to just kind of self-experiment, take a little bit of meat out of my diet, instead sub it with another form of protein, be it lentils, be it our own stuff. And I noticed that my recovery time was a fraction. And selfishly, I was just like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, stick to this a little bit more stringently and, and see if it really does affect my performance. And fast forward to now, I, you know, um, I still do eat a bit of seafood on occasion, but un unfortunately my, my body can't really process, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the heavier meats anymore. I, I don't carry any sort of ethical tint to it. You know, we all got a, we all got a, a time when it's curtains and if you're able to, to honor an animal and and get some protein out of it good on you i'll save it for you you know but but my my body uh kind of passed that point and um you know i i feel better for it and um yeah it's it's been it's been pretty wild if i i think it's funny too everybody keeps referencing this game changers movie um the football player you alluded to griff I actually catered his wedding uh, with Beyond and had to listen to one of the worst best man uh, toasts of my life. It was, if, if you're a football fan, it was uh, the, the guy from Stanford, Andrew Luck. It was as 
awkward and jokey as you could possibly never hope to imagine. But, um, but yeah, I, I really think, you know, just letting folks go down that rabbit hole for themselves, find out all these benefits uh, for themselves, whether it's, you know, on an ethical level, on a personal performance level, on a health level, uh, the, the dividends just kind of keep building upon itself. And, and being preachy only steers people further away. We are at our time. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, a really interesting 90 minutes. Um, you know, we, we looked at uh, this particular subject through a couple of different lenses, uh, both with the opportunity and growth side, uh, certainly from a philosophical, um, ethical, and sustainability approach, uh, uh, and certainly some personal uh, stories and some success stories as uh, businesses start up. Uh, I can't begin to thank everybody enough for all of your time today, uh, your insights, your presentations. Um, Manal, Ben, uh, I will be coming into the restaurant sometime soon, so I'll make sure that I uh, do uh, say hello. Uh, and then just to answer the question, uh, my own question, uh, I do consume meat. I am trying to consume less of it. Um, you know, we, we love, uh, I love seafood. Uh, you know, I grew up in Ontario. Don't hold it against me. We didn't have a lot of fresh seafood in Ontario. When I moved to BC, I fell in love and it's hard to step away from that. Uh, but what we do here at home is we do incorporate uh, more vegetables uh, into the everyday meals and less packaged and refined foods, um, more natural uh, ingre ingredients. Um, thank you again, everybody, for all of your time today. I really, really do appreciate it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. I'll have a recording of this. I'll make it available to you. Uh, as soon as possible so we can all look at the camera and have a little giggle at ourselves every once in a while. Um, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you again and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Have See a great you day. Thanks everyone. Cheers everybody. Take, Take care. Well.